The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Every election takes the temperature of the electorate, but that doesn't usually include the kind of vitriol and anger seen boiling over at some campaign stops right here in Ontario. Is this Canada's angriest election? We'll consider that tonight. Then, a look at what the party platforms proposed to deal with the shadow pandemic that killed more than 2,400 Ontarians last year, the opioids crisis. It's Monday, September 13th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. Loud, angry crowds frothing at the mouth at party leaders on the hustings just isn't what most Canadians expect to see during a campaign. Some of what's happened is truly shocking. What is going on? With us to consider that, we welcome, in the nation's capital, Frank Graves. He's the founder of Ecos Research and an adjunct research professor at Carleton University. And John Ibbotson, writer at large for The Globe and Mail. And in the provincial capital, Queen's University professor Amarnath Amarasingham also senior research fellow at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue and a fellow at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization, and Supriya Devetti, senior counsel at the national strategic communications firm Enterprise and a visiting researcher at the Ryerson Journalism Research Center. So good to have you four on the program tonight for what is um, sadly uh, an increasing phenomenon in Canadian politics these days. And uh, just to get our conversation started, let's take a look at a little bit of this. And you saw at the end there that famous gravel being thrown at the Prime Minister. Justin Trudeau, the Liberal leader, saying, I've never seen this intensity of anger on the campaign trail or in Canada. Let's do a little history here and see if this is in fact new or whether we have been here before. Again, another graphic, please. In 1968, on the eve of that election, Pierre Trudeau was attending a Saint-Jean-Baptiste Day parade in Montreal when separatist protesters threw rocks and bottles at the grandstand. Mr. Trudeau stayed in the reviewing stand and would not be intimidated away. In 1982, after Pierre Trudeau famously flipped the bird to protesters in British Columbia, his train car was pelted with rocks and eggs and tomatoes at various stops on the way. His 10-year-old son, Justin, was in the train car with him at the time. In 1990, outside a fundraising dinner in Toronto, protesters carried an effigy of then Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, along with a sign reading, Free Trade is Treason. According to a press report at the time, quote, they chased his limousine, shouted at him to resign, and at one point tried to spit on him. All right, let's get into this. John, start us off here. Is what we're seeing on the hustings in this election campaign different? Yes, I think it is. Um, there are other examples I, of demonstrations. I'm thinking, for example, of those in Ontario, 1995, 1996. There were actual riots. Uh, there was a public inquiry and called into one uh, because it was so violent. Um, so it's not as though we don't have a history of violence and demonstrations uh, towards political leaders. They come sometimes from the left and they come sometimes from the right. Uh, but what is different this time is I think that it is all being exacerbated by two forces. Uh, one is the presidency of Donald Trump, which has pushed the idea that there is uh, a vein of right-wing populist uh, politics that is demonstrative and that supported the president of the United States, sustained him. So that makes it legitimate up here. And then, of course, there's COVID, which has, I think, rubbed all nerves raw um, throughout the society. We are all under incredible stress. We are all enduring the fourth wave of this pandemic. Um, I don't know about you, but temperatures have sometimes risen a bit in my household. Um, and for some people, I think the, the stress uh, of COVID, coupled as well with the accessibility of social media, which makes it possible to organize in ways it wasn't possible 20 years ago, has led to what we're seeing today. Supriya, how about to you? Is what we're seeing on the hustings today different from those examples I gave earlier? 
Yeah, I think it is. And I think for a lot of the reasons that John sort of laid out there, I, I would have to agree with. But the other thing that I would add to that is, you know, back in the Trudeau senior years or the Mulroney years, and, you know, full caveat, I was either very young or not alive during that time. Um, I, but I would have to say that from everything I've read and everything that existed at the time, you didn't necessarily also have opposition polit uh, politicians that were ginning up or fomenting the same sort of environment that we're sort of seeing, right? And, you know, this is very different than what we're seeing today. You've had opposition politicians speaking at rallies where Trudeau for, for treason signs have been present. That was very evident during the United We Roll convoy, or by sitting down with outlets, you know, like the rebel, um, who have actively engaged in all sorts of, of nonsense by contributing to the misinformation or disinformation problem that we're seeing, which tends to, you know, exacerbate a, a lot of the kind of anger that we're seeing. And then the other part of this is that I don't know if we had opposition politicians back in, in those days that were, you know, sometimes contributing very actively and explicitly to the um, conspiracy theory ecosystem, like we're seeing today with, you know, the, the Great Reset, um, or by suggesting that M103, you know, a non-binding parliamentary motion when it was being debated back in 2017, that it was somehow going to criminalize any uh, criticism of Islam or during the debate around the UN um, pact for, for global migration, that that was somehow going to mean that Canada was signing over our borders to the UN. So it, I think it, it is very different. Frank Graves, we have heard these protesters described by the prime minister as a mob. Can you give us some sense about, uh, demographically speaking anyway, who they are? Yeah, and I, I, I kind of, I'd like to locate them more. I'm, I'm looking at it through the prism of, of public opinion and how that's been shifting. And uh, I can definitely, these, these protests are, 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 are certainly a reflection of some of the anger, which I do believe is unprecedented. Uh, it's not unusual for elections to generate more heat than light. But I think what we've seen in this election is something which is the culmination of a, a couple of factors which have been going on for some time. Uh, the first of those is we, the levels of effective polarization in the country, the degree to which you don't like the other team, you, you don't really recognize them as having legitimate views, is reaching all-time highs. And that's been rising in both Canada and the United States. Interestingly, in studies that have done in Europe, we're not seeing that. Effective polarization is actually declining. The more troubling problem is the rise of what some have called authoritarian, what I prefer to call uh, ordered populism, which is a, a, a response or a reflex to a whole series of factors that have been developing over the last decade or two. But what they produced is an intensely polarized uh, electorate, which you see vividly expressed in these kinds of disagreements. By the way, if I look at my polling data, I'm now finding that although the anger seems to be focused in the protesters, that the vast majority of the public who would let's call them the rational majority who have for example uh, inoculated themselves and are abiding by npis and so forth their, their level of frustration with this and their belief that this fourth wave is actually the, the product of this th these groups which have not vaccinated and are preventing others from doing so by kind of sharing things is really really high the final point uh, which already been raised is the issue of, of disinformation uh, disinformation being actively curated as, in some cases, a tool of statecraft coming from other countries and sometimes emanating from within our country as society as a tool of anarchy. But I can show that there, the levels of radicalization are directly collected, connected to the levels of disinformation which are being, uh, uh, you know, s s s uh, provoked by these uh, sources of uh, disinformation. And it's a really troubling new feature, which is making things worse. You did mention the vaccination program in the midst of that answer. And Amarnath, I want to go to you on that because you have studied right-wing extremism in this country. And I guess I'm wondering whether you see a connection between the anti-vax protesters that seem to be tagging along the prime minister wherever he goes and right-wing extremism. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, what, what's, what we've noticed since the rise of Trump in the U.S., and especially since about March 2020 uh, with the pandemic and lockdowns, is that a whole host of COVID conspiracies, vaccine conspiracies, anti-lockdown agitation, um, all of this has kind of served as a bug light for different groups and different movements, right? And so they found a kind of common cause with what was already being said with COVID conspiracies and anti-lockdown agitation. And so this is why you're seeing at protests like these, um, everyday people who are kind of angry with the lockdowns, but also 
uh, neo-Nazi groups, right, and 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 QAnon um, protesters and things like that. And so it doesn't mean, of course, that everyone at this lockdown protest um, is a neo-Nazi, but it does mean that uh, right-wing extremist groups, as well as a whole host of other groups, are finding. Um, or are using the lockdown protests to kind of mainstream themselves, right? So we're much more likely to hear uh, about them and their views through the anti-lockdown agitation, whereas in the past we would have never heard about them because nobody would have covered uh, a random neo-Nazi group protesting on the corner. Whereas now, because they're in front of hospitals and because they're latching onto and piggybacking on uh, much larger, more mainstream anti-lockdown agitation, um, they're, they're, they're just part of the mix now. Well, let's make sure we're all talking about the same thing here. When I hear right-wing extremist and then I see lots of signs for the People's Party of Canada on the hustings, um, many of whom are behind the demonstrations against uh, Justin Trudeau. Okay, Sapria, do you think People's Party supporters are right-wing extremists? I mean, I don't think every single People's Party supporter is indeed a right-wing extremist, but I think we would be somewhat naive to suggest that there isn't at least a certain degree of overlap. And, you know, we've been talking a little bit about vaccines here, and I would sort of make the same sort of parallel, like just with vaccine hesitancy, as there is indeed a gradation, right? You have the people that are uh, accosting healthcare workers and patients outside of hospitals, but there are also those that are just generally, you know, have legitimate concerns with either the government or the healthcare system and mm -hmm. can indeed still be brought over onto the other side of the fence by accepting vaccines, I think PPC supporters are largely within that same group, that you are going to find a bit of a gradation. And, and that is, I think, the challenge for some of the more mainstream parties um, and political actors to try and bring the folks within the PPC tent that are still indeed, uh, you know, not fully far gone, um, bring them back into their own tents. John, in the last election campaign, the People's Party was pretty new. They got 1% of the vote. They really weren't much of a factor at all. Uh, many pollsters, including Frank Graves on this program, have had them as high as 11% in the province of Ontario. How are they, in your judgment, affecting the potential outcome of this campaign? I think they could indeed affect the potential outcome of the campaign uh, to the detriment of the Conservative Party. Uh, again, I would say two things are at work here. Uh, one is that um, Aaron O'Toole has moved the Conservative Party uh, towards the centre, even in some areas, such as workers' rights and portable pensions to the centre-left. Um, he is distancing himself uh, from the more extreme elements of the social conservative movement um, in order to appeal to middle-class, mainstream, suburban voters in Ontario, the voters who typically elect the government. As he does that, he... Um, opens up his right flank and allows people who might in the past have seen themselves as reluctantly conservative because they weren't very happy with Stephen Harper and they weren't very happy with Andrew Scheer. They didn't think those leaders were giving them uh, the agenda that they wanted on gun rights and on abortion. Uh, but nonetheless, they were within the party. They're leaving the party, I suspect, and moving over um, to, to the People's Party. I don't think they're anywhere near 11%, but the compendium polls, such as T38 Canada, have them at 6%, and that is a significant uh, vote. And if it shows up in uh, some ridings in, Toronto, in, in Ontario, in rural areas and in suburban areas, um, it could affect them. And then again, as I said, there is the issue of COVID and the way it has increased tensions. There's also, if I can just add one more thing, we have to also look at the general degradation of the quality of debate within the within politics itself and how that contributes to it. Um, starting in 2004, um, the Liberal Party began uh, a program of essentially outright falsehoods against the Conservative Party, accused them of a hidden agenda, accused them of, of, of wanting to move to ban abortions, accused them of wanting to strip away gun rights um, and the like. The Conservatives, in turn, eventually responded. So you have Aaron O'Toole, for example, in this campaign, saying that the Liberals uh, uh, would, would tax your house if you tried to sell it, and that is just also false. As the mainstream political parties um, actually get closer together ideologically, but then more extreme in the vitriol they fling at each other, it lowers the course, uh, the, the, the quality of political debate overall. And that too contributes then to the marginalization of some people uh, and their movement towards extreme positions, uh, mostly on the right, but also for some on the left as well. Well, Frank, I wonder if you can help us with the premise that John just advanced there in as much as 
The conventional wisdom certainly is that any vote for the People's Party is a vote that otherwise would have gone to the Conservative Party, and therefore their presence in this election campaign hurts the Conservatives the most. Does your polling indicate whether that's true? Yes, it does, but there's a paradox here, because the Conservatives are doing better, and the People's Party are doing better, so if they're coming from some finite zero-sum pool, then how can you explain that paradox? And the answer is that the Conservatives, by positioning themselves more to the center or moderate side of the spectrum, have actually attracted liberal voters in Ontario and British Columbia in particular, who are more concerned with fiscal issues and economic issues. And that has been offset, though, by the fact that the people who are in the People's Party are almost exclusively drawn from people who voted, uh, uh, voted for the Conservatives in the last election. You know, there's some who voted People's Party, which, as we know, is a picky portion. But I, a couple of points, because they do have a very distinct demographic and psychographic profile. For example, they tend to be under 50. So this isn't the Tea Party movement of old. This isn't Earl. These are young, working-class males, college or high school educated. Uh, they're uh, possibly more common in rural areas. Unlike in the United States, where a lot of this uh, polarization, this populism is bounded by race, it isn't so much in Canada. But the other thing which is really unique about them is, and I hear people talking about vaccine hesitancy. Uh, I sit on a federal task force on vaccine competence, trying to figure out how to ensure that Canadians do take the jab. And the country's done remarkably well on this. But those who have not taken the vaccine at this stage, which is roughly 15% of Canadians who are eligible, um, have a very distinct profile. In, in, for example, amongst liberal, conserv uh, liberal uh, NDP and bloc voters, the numbers who have taken the vaccine is 97, 98%, it's adults. The number is still very high for conservatives at 83%, but still lower. And the residual non-vaccinators uh, say they're not getting it. But then we move into the, the People's Party, we find that 30% only say they've taken the vaccine. And what we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, and I've been polling pretty well daily since it started, was that the people's views on things like masks and vaccines were disconnected. But as time has gone on, they've been tightly connected and they think they're being steered by disinformation. Another final comment is at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a lot of the intense polarization that had gripped the country coming and we saw expressed in the 2000, 2019 election two wary candidates with income and immeasurable divide eyeing each other uneasily from opposite sides of the cliff. That remarkably diminished in the early stages of the end of the pandemic. Uh, everybody, there's maybe no, uh, uh, there's no ATS in a fox, so there's no libertarians in a pandemic, at least at the beginning, but they crept back in and now are expressing themselves perhaps more fiercely than we'd seen at the, at, and they're now being focused, I think, on the issue, really the pivotal issue is vaccine passports, which most believe is a way of closing the deal and getting on to recovery but which is intensely opposed by a sizable, almost everybody in the People's Party, but frankly, half of conservative voters. So this is, this is really a new dynamic, and I think in some respects, deeply troubling. Hmm. Amarnath, I want to set up my next question to you by just uh, taking a moment here to tell you that last week, I went up to a riding in York Region just to follow one of the candidates knocking on doors and see what issues came up. And it was the Liberal candidate in this case, and she told me at the end of the day, uh, you know, I've seen People's Party supporters out there, and they scream at me, they call me a Nazi, they call me a fascist. Uh, they're really quite vitriolic and quite angry. So my question for you is, what is the psychological appeal of being that angry? Um, I, I mean, I think particularly with what we've seen with COVID, um, it's given people a sense of uh, agency over um, their lives again, right? And so, um, we, you know, G German, there's a German sociologist named Ulrich Beck, for example, who talks about the risk society, and he says the late modern condition is that all of the risks that we face, or quite a few of the risks that we face, are largely outside of our control: climate change, pandemics, etc. So something that happens in Wuhan, China, all of a sudden means that my kids can't go to school, right? And so the idea that um, we have no real control over the things that affect our lives, um, which many of us are now quite aware of over the last year and a half, I think um, cr puts people in a situation where um, conspiracy theories, polarization, anger, um, th seeing minor political differences as kind of cosmic issues, as uh, Frank was saying earlier, in terms of um, this is now part of Canadian identity, and you know, uh, thing, something core, something uh, to the core of Canada is being lost, um, and feeling like you 
um, or you know have the have the secret to kind of uh, fix that, and you have to wait. You have a personal responsibility to wake up a sleeping Canadian masses to this to what's happening to them. Um, all of the all of that is quite empowering and 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 puts people back in the driver's seat, right? And I think that's the kind of uh, energy that we're seeing now um, in in a lot of these kinds of movements, which. Um, uh, it's kind of what's always driven a lot of these conspiratorial movements in the past. Supriya, let me get your take on that. What is your, or how do you understand the source of the anger that we're seeing on the hustings? Yeah, I mean, I think the source of it, it, it isn't necessarily as simple as saying, oh, pandemic, it was it was COVID. And I'm not suggesting that was uh, that's what Am Amarnath was saying at, at all. I, I think the, the the source has already has always sort of been there, right? Uh, it's just that the pandemic has, has exacerbated it, much in the way that we've seen with respect to systemic inequalities that have always sort of existed in our system are now simply being exacerbated by the pandemic. And I think when you're talking about, you know, the difference between protests and organizing today versus in either either the late 80s or the, the 90s, the, the differences are, are quite obvious. It's really easy to find like-minded people when you have social media and you have these messaging apps um, or message boards where, uh, you know, back in, 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 in earlier days, you would have to mail out flyers or physically try and door knock to find people or, or hold these telephone town halls. Now, all of a sudden, you join a Facebook page and there you go. You have 10,000 like-minded individuals and you have a, a, a good sizable group to be able to draw on to get your point across through protests or through other means. So, John, let me follow up with you on that. How organized does this all seem to be? It is starting to become organized uh, to some extent within uh, the People's Party of Canada, um, but I don't even want to give it that much credit. Uh, I think um, the Globe reporters who have investigated this uh, suggest that the uh, some evangelical churches are involved in organizing people. Uh, there may be some coalescing of support around the People's Party of Canada. There uh, are, yes, like-minded Facebook pages. Uh, at one point, it almost seemed that there was a mold inside the Liberal uh, tour because as soon as the location was announced, there were people uh, showing up to protest. Um, I but I think the most important question is not how organized is it. The question is, is it bound to grow or will it diminish over time? And here, I like to be uh, to feel more optimistic uh, than pessimistic. I do think that COVID is, uh, as I say, rubbing us all our nerves raw. I do think that once the pandemic ends and tensions ease, uh, that we will see a decline in the support for the People's Party and the decline in support for this kind of extremism. I don't think that there is as much anti-immigrant sentiment in this country as there is in the United States. I don't think that we uh, uh, embrace the notion that we are a white Christian nation as much as some people do in the United States. I do think if we can get um, times to return to normal, and they will eventually, we'll see this begin to ebb. And therefore, whatever organization there is will become more disorganized. Well, let me put that premise to Frank Graves. What role do you sense that this world is becoming a much more dangerous place in which to live, and that is somehow putting fuel in the fire behind this movement? Well, that's, a fast, that's a terrific question, because we've been tracking things like, overall, do you think the world's become more dangerous, stayed about the same, or is actually safer? Most experts would say in the last decade, the world's probably a little safer, but it, you know, they certainly wouldn't say it's become more dangerous. Whereas about 80% of Canadians now think it's become more dangerous, only 7% think it's become safer, which is the wrong answer. It's interesting because if we go back a little further, Beck is, uh, and, his, and his notions of risk and, and the locus of control being external, that's spot on. But there's earlier sociologists which has been re reestablishing itself. I'm thinking of the work of Theodore Adorno and the theory of authoritarianism that was developed in the aftermath of the Second World War to try and understand how the most civilized side, society on the planet had fallen into the abyss of the, uh, the Holocaust. And the best explanation they got when they came back to, uh, to New York with Hannah Arendt and, and others was that it was the exploitation of an authoritarian personality, which was uh, driven to organize and sort itself and look for a strong man on a horse. A lot of this stuff was re reestablished itself 
because it eerily fit, fit, it predicted things like not only Donald Trump, but earlier Brexit. And in fact, in an article I published in the University of Calgary's policy journal, it was the prime predictor of how you voted in the last election, at least conservative voting. And it wasn't asking any questions about politics. It asked questions about child rearing. When you raise a child, is it more important to emphasize obedience or creativity? Divide things pretty evenly. <laughs> but now when all of those things come together, and the factors which produce them percolating for a long time, hyper-concentration of wealth at the top, a sense of status and identity loss for those who have been feeling that sense of stagnation, a cultural backlash, the values I used to believe in are no longer the relevant ones and they're a threat of ending, uh, external threat. But this produces this response, which produces hostility to outgroups, many of the kinds of things, uh, mistrust in authorities and science, uh, and, and I think it superimposed itself on the pandemic, not only the conclusion of the pandemic, perhaps more importantly, the contest for the future. What will post-pandemic Canada look like? And you've got these very starkly divided images based in visions, based on, I think, a lot of these forces which are operating. And I don't believe that they're going to be solved shortly, but I think there are some answers, but we have to look at the root causes which put them in place if you want to have any hope. Of, of, how, of dealing permanently dealing with them. Well, let's put uh, what may very well be a bit of a catch twenty two to Amarnath, which is the sense of um, the sense of panic that these problems create among this constituency that we've been talking about here. Presumably, makes them less likely to trust the very institutions in our society that are going to be responsible for resolving these problems. So, how do we get around that? Well, it's, it's what John Stewart said uh, a couple of weeks ago, right? Is that these problems are absolutely caused by science, but it's only science that's going to fix them. And I think I think it, it it it's the problem of late modern society where the exact institutions that um, are going to cause the risks that uh, Beck was talking about um, are also demand the same level of trust. And I think I mean just. Uh, going back to what was said earlier with uh, with uh, with Frank's comment, I think you know I, I spent a lot of time on far right and neo Nazi forums, probably more than is healthy. Um, and what, one of the things that's one of the things that's quite obvious is yes, there's absolute uh, support behind the P uh, PPC, but the other thing is that it a lot of what Canadian extremists are concerned about um, are actually transnational issues, right? And so the, um, uh, John's absolutely right that you know we're less kind of anti-immigrant and anti-xenophobic uh, or uh, xenophobic and, and and so on, but I think. The information coming from uh, abroad, from Europe, from movements in the U.S. is also galvanizing um, a subset of Canadians to see things uh, elevated across identity lines, right? And so basic policy disagreements where that used to just be basic policy disagreements are now um, are leading to people calling for the hanging of Trudeau and, and, and for Trudeau as a traitor to what, what to the true essence of Canada and so on. And so everything's becoming elevated to kind of hyper... Um, emotional, cosmic uh, levels of polarization, which I think is also quite a unique aspect of what we've uh, this this particular election than than in the past. Um, so it is going to require a level of trust in kind of these institutions of modernity to get beyond it. But I think um, I'm not at all optimistic um, about um, where this is going, given what we've seen in parts of Europe and the U.S. Well, let's pick up on that. This notion of trust—it's the word that we hear all of the political leaders using on a daily basis on the hustings. And we want to look at some numbers. Let's uh, share them with our viewers here. This is from something called the Governance Monitor. It's a joint initiative between TVO, the Institute on Governance, Advanced Symbolics, and iPolitics, and it tracks the impact of the election campaign on how much trust Canadians have in their government. So, when this election was called on August 15th, Canadians' trust in government stood at 57%. It then dipped to 51% by the end of August, and as of September 7th, it has come back a bit now to 55%. Trust in our public institutions apparently is lowest in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Quebec. It is highest in British Columbia, Manitoba, and Ontario. And the 5% of Canadians on the far right report the lowest level of trust in their government. Supriya, get us started on this. Are we moving towards a potential collapse in social trust? 
I certainly hope not. Um, I kind of share Amarnath's not being super optimistic about being able to shove all the toothpaste back into the tube, so to speak, when we're talking about these latent feelings of, of xenophobia or, or racism that have definitely bubbled up. But I would like to think that as it relates to the trust in institutions, this is a little bit of a blip because of uh, the pandemic and because of some of the issues that are somewhat acute to the time that we're seeing right now. And I mean, I think you can take the Conservative Party's move movement towards the center and particularly in the way that Mr. O'Toole has been running his campaign as this, you know, moderate sort of centrist guy uh, to the notion that the center is indeed still where the vast majority of Canadians are. And that is where the vast majority of Canadians are still holding um, trust in all of our institutions. And I, I, I would like to think that this sort of you know, anomaly that that we're seeing once we do get back to so-called you know normal times again, and uh, we're not talking about viruses mutating on a constant basis, um, then you'll start to see some of that edge back up. John, how much do you worry about a loss of public trust? Well, we always need to worry about any signs of public trust uh, in our institutions and our political system is declining because without that trust, democracy is not possible. It is very dangerously low in the United States, and I would say democracy is at risk right now in the United States. But I don't think we're here yet. The more in, the, the real question is, well, then what can we, each and every one of us, do about it? What can we do to restore and preserve and protect the broadest possible sense of public trust? Part of it is to try to understand the motivations uh, and feelings and worries and concerns of those who don't have that trust or who are losing that trust. And here I have to say I do worry. I worry about us. I worry about the five of us on this panel. I think there is, for better, whether we whether we try to or, or not, uh, we but we bring to this debate a sense of condescension. Would anyone who is losing trust in our institutions, in our politics, listening to the five of us talk about this, feel that we in any way? have reflected their priorities or their concerns, that we were listening to them. Uh, do we not, in um, our Laurentian way, make the problem worse when we talk amongst ourselves about what those people over there are doing and thinking without ever trying to actually connect with those people uh, over there? And how do we address that? How do we find ways to connect with them? Um, there are, I think, answers to that. But the first answer is we need to stop looking down our nose so much. Well, uh, OK, let me let me put this to Frank. You know, there was a column written by Susan Delacorte of the Star last week in which this group was described as ungovernable and some kind of democratic mutation. Now, I don't think she was, you know, turning her nose up at them. I don't think she meant to be condescending. I think she was genuinely expressing a deep seated fear that that this was a group that simply was so far out of the mainstream as to be unreachable. Uh, could you comment on that? I think you have to lead, although I, I certainly agree with John's point that the usual sort of a, a elite response or institutional response to these types of uh, popu populist uh, expressions, particularly authoritarian populism, are somewhere between sneering and denial or the, you know, Hillary Clinton, you know, you're a, a basket full of deplorables, which frankly just makes things worse because it adds emotional fuel to the fire for those who are depicted as such, and that's the last thing you want to do. We also have to recognize that the ability to reach some of those groups through the tr traditional tools of moral suasion, reason, and evidence is basically, uh, it's just not available right now. And so on questions like how do you want to close the pandemic, you may have to recognize that at least until this problem dissipates, which is a longer term challenge, you're going to have to use blunter instruments, uh, which will involve leaving them unhappy, uh, such as a vaccine passport. But I do want to point out that there are the, 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 the erosion of trust in, in advanced Western democracies has been going on for 50 years. And in Canada, and the United States is basically worked in lockstep. Uh, the tracking uh, which asks questions like can trust the government in Washington or Ottawa to do the right thing all or most of the time. In the salad days of the 70s, about 80% of Canadians and Americans agreed with that. The elite accommodation model, they're going to take care of us. That's all fine. That's declined precipitously at the same rate in both countries until very recently, where it's now under 20%. That's a profound difference. Uh, we also found that in trying to understand 
things like receptivity to vaccinations, that by far the best predictor is whether you trust government, whether you trust science, and that these issues of trust over the last several years have become sorted in a way which makes uh, is really unhealthy. So Priya, let me give you the last 30 seconds on this. Do you think the people that we are talking about tonight are reachable? I think some of them are, um, and I would circle back to the point I initially made. I think there's a gradation. I think that there are indeed some people that can still be reached and that are, you know, decent people that are reaching out to the PPC simply because they are disaffected and don't feel as though the other mainstream parties reflect them. But I, I think we're being somewhat overly naive if we don't recognize that there are indeed some folks that are going to be completely unreachable, that are indeed deplorable, and hold all, all sorts of odious views, whether it's about you know xenophobia or or racism or anti-Semitism that I don't know if a, a a moderate or modern political party can actually do any good in trying to reach them because I think they are ultimately unreachable. This is one of those discussions where I wish we really had a lot more time because you've given us all a lot to think about tonight and um, to be continued. I would hope to say John Ibbotson, Frank Graves, Supriya Devetti, Amarnath Amara Singham. Thanks so much for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Pleasure. While all eyes have focused on the COVID-19 pandemic over the past year and a half, there is another terrible health emergency unfolding, the opioids crisis. It was bad before, it's much worse now with fatal overdoses up 60% in Ontario. Joining us now for a closer look, we welcome Dr. Quam McKenzie, CEO at the health policy nonprofit, the Wellesley Institute, and a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. And Dr. Hassan Sheikh, emergency and addictions physician in Toronto and assistant professor in family and community medicine at the U of T. And it's good to see you two again. Happy to have you on our program. Uh, let me just start with a bit of a fact file to set the scene for our discussion to come. According to the Public Health Agency of Canada, between January of 2016 and December 2020, more than 21,000 people died from opioids. In the year 2020, 17 Canadians died every day from opioid poisoning or overdose. The federal government has not released the numbers for 2021 yet, but Justin Ling, the journalist at McLean's Magazine, has looked at the provincial numbers for this year, and here is what he found. British Columbia reporting that 1,011 people died between January and June of this year. That's up 33% over last year. Saskatchewan reported 221 deaths between January and August. That's already two-thirds of last year's total deaths. Ontario counted 638 deaths between January and March. That's 57% higher than in the same period last year. All right, Quam, how would you characterize what we are facing in Canada at the moment with opioids? Well, we're in a very difficult position. We've had a war on drugs, but it doesn't seem to have worked with regards to opioids. Um, we, I know we've been going through the pandemic and we've been uh, worried about uh, COVID, obviously, for good reason. But in some places, uh, such as BC, uh, more people have died in the last year from opioid addictions than, than COVID-19. So when we start thinking about it in those terms, you can see that uh, we're in a really bad place with regards to uh, op opioid deaths. Hassan Sheikh, to what extent do you think the pandemic COVID-19 pandemic, that is, has made the opioid situation even worse than it might otherwise have been. Yeah, it has certainly made the already dire situation much worse. And you put out some numbers there. You know, when I talk to my patients, it's been a desperate situation for them. You know, the pandemic has made us all scared, more anxious. And that's when people who use drugs are at their most vulnerable. And in addition, we've asked people to actually socially isolate at this time. So they've lost whatever, you know, minimal social supports they had, and they're using a loan, and that's an extremely dangerous time for people. There was a question uh, last week in the English language leaders debate that related to the opioid situation. Are you, Quam, to you first, are you satisfied with the amount of attention the opioid crisis has received during the election campaign? Well, 
as a mental health uh, advocate, I'd always like there to be more attention to mental health. Uh, but I don't want it just to be during the campaign. I want uh, uh, some focus on mental health now and focus on mental health for whoever gets into power afterwards. So I, I, I um, always want there to be more talked about, but I don't want it just to be in the context of an election. I want it to lead to real change. Now, I appreciate your position. Uh, Hassan, how about for you? Uh, obviously, myriad issues out there that the candidates, the leaders have to consider. Opioids did come up in the debate. Were you satisfied with that? I really have not been satisfied. You know, the last 18 months have shown us how we need a central plan when it comes to a public health emergency. And the opioid crisis is a public health emergency. And we don't see the same proper, well thought out plan for that. All four of the major parties running in the province of Ontario do have uh, things to say about the opioid crisis and what they are promising to do. And I want to take just a moment now to briefly outline some of what the parties have on offer. So, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this graphic up here. Starting uh, with the Liberals, the uh, Liberals would propose to invest $25 million for public education to reduce the stigma associated with problematic substance use. They've got $500 million in their plan for a full range of evidence-based treatment, and they'd like to reform the criminal code to repeal relevant mandatory minimum penalties. The Conservatives, the second-place party in the last parliament, would invest $325 million over the next three years to create 1,000 residential drug treatment beds. Law enforcement should focus on dealers and traffickers, say the Conservatives, and all policies have the reduction of harm and promotion of recovery as their objectives. The NDP would immediately declare the overdose crisis a national public health emergency. They would purport to create a safe supply of medically regulated alternatives to toxic street drugs and end the criminalization and stigma of drug addiction. And the Greens declare that the drug poisoning crisis is a national public health emergency. They would create a national safe supply of drugs of choice and decriminalize the possession of illicit drugs for personal use. Let's, uh, you know what, I think maybe the best thing to do here is just, with all of that having been said, let me get, uh, Quam, to you first, your expertise on what you, what stands out for you there as being particularly useful or relevant given the challenges afoot. I'll just give you a bit of context in how I'm thinking. So one of the things that has happened during the pandemic is that we've had a significant change in who is actually uh, dying from opioids. And uh, we've got more people uh, who are not in contact with services or who would probably never have been in contact with services and more accidental deaths because of a toxic supply of fentanyl. So we've seen the supply of opioids change to make them more dangerous. The reason I say that is because if we're thinking about saving lives, just increasing treatment will not do the trick because a lot of the people who are dying are not people who would be in contact with services or who uh, believe they need services. Uh, and a lot of people are dying because of accidents because now the supply of uh, a particular opioid fent fentanyl is so toxic that very small amounts will kill people. So if we want to deal with that, we have to do something about toxic supply and safe supply, as well as doing something about treatment, which means that we need to really, really change up what we're doing. So when I see, uh, and I think the, the platform seem to bifurcate, on the one hand, we've got the NDP and the Greens saying we need to fundamentally change things. And then on the other side, we have the Conservatives and the Liberals that seem to be saying in their platforms, we need more of the same. Uh, and my view from the research and from all of the policy work that I've seen is more of the same, more treatment and all of the other things, that's good, but it won't actually solve the problem. You need something much more fundamental if you want to really save people's lives. 
Okay, Hassan, again, I'm not asking you to endorse anybody's platform in particular, but what stands out as being particularly useful here? Yeah, I think what really stands out to me is what seems like an uh, artificial distinction between treatment and harm reduction. When I think about almost everything I do in medicine, it's all harm reduction. When I treat someone's diabetes, I'm not curing their diabetes. I'm reducing the harms of high blood sugar. But when it comes to people who use drugs, we seem to have made these artificial distinctions where you're either for you know, safe supply and decriminalization or you're for kind of recovery and abstinence-based treatment. And I think that's really dangerous. And I'll give you an example of why. You know, for some of my patients, they live in sober housing where you know they can't use substances or they lose their housing. We have a housing crisis where if they do relapse, they have nowhere to go. And so they have to choose between keeping their housing or using in the bathroom of a fast food restaurant alone when they're at highest risk. And we make people make these impossible choices as opposed to providing a large spectrum of options, reducing the barriers between them and letting people you know, get the treatment they need when they need it and where they need it. And that's not the fundamental shift that I'm seeing in these platforms. Okay, a couple of follow-ups here uh, for you, Hassan. Number one, um, we're not ignoring the People's Party here, but from what we saw in their platform, they did not speak to this issue. That's why they were not on the list uh, of what we just enumerated. Second thing is, you know, there was a time, Hassan, in this country when, when the Conservative Party was very much more focused on uh, punishment and a, a sort of a criminal approach to this. And they seem in this campaign to have focused much more on uh, harm, reduc harm reduction and sickness treatment. Um, at least they've been getting a lot of positive notices for that. Have you noticed that in what they have on offer? So I think it's a step in the right direction. And I would say it's a tiny step in the right direction in the sense that they are kind of saying globally that they embrace harm reduction. But if you look at their actual platform, there's a lot of uh, wording around, you know, living a drug-free life and, you know, increasing treatment. And when we force that paradigm on people, we actually create real harms. And so I think what we really need to see is a shift towards an idea of a comprehensive set of treatments and reducing the barriers between them. And Quam, my follow-up for you on this is, and I, and I ask you this question, given that you were the co-chair of Health Canada's Expert Task Force on Substance Use, where you folks said in your report, it is time for a paradigm shift in policy. Do you see a paradigm shift in any of those four platforms? Well, I'm working on the assumption that some of the people who wrote the platforms had read the expert task force on substance misuses um, two uh, reports. And if anybody hasn't read them, uh, they're sort of a wonderful group of experts who came together. I was lucky to be one of a number of people co-chairing. And there's uh, some really deep thinking on what needs to be done to improve uh, the lives of uh, people who use substances, but actually substance use policy in general in Canada, and that's uh, up on the uh, Health Canada website. And we really said that um, just more treatment and expanding treatment services, as uh, uh, lots of people have said, is a good thing, really good thing. We just don't think it will solve the problem. The problem isn't just more treatment, the problem is decreasing the number of people who need treatment and the way you do that is by having better policy and so lots of people have talked about uh, the war on drugs ending up being like a war on the people who use drugs and so you need to decrease the number of people who are ending up in prison for simple possession of uh, drugs. Um, then some people have said, well, you know, people are using toxic drugs because they can't get a safe supply of drugs, so we need to increase the su safe supply of drugs. And some people, uh, including think people like the uh, global task forces that have been out there, have said you've got to go even further and you've got to think about regulating drugs, uh, regulating opioids like you, like we regulate cannabis or alcohol uh, and working out how people can get a supply 
of, of that in a safe way. Uh, so that's where people are going. And it's that paradigm shift of saying, well, you know, we haven't actually managed to deal with the opioid crisis by uh, the war on drugs. We need to do something different. And we need to think about whether the road we've been going down uh, is actually going to work. And, and if I look at the platforms, as I said, it looks like the NDP and the Greens are talking about that. Uh, the Liberals have left the door open to that, saying that they are um, want a uh, strategy uh, to deal, uh, a big strategy to deal with the opioid problems, but they haven't uh, detailed that. Uh, and as you said in the previous question, uh, the Conservatives have moved over uh, a bit to, towards the centre, uh, talking uh, less about uh, criminalisation and punishment and penalisation and more about health and um, uh, and uh, uh, harm reduction, uh, which is a welcome step uh, in the right direction. Having said that, Hassan, the, and this is a question the Liberals get all the time, of course, and I'll put it to you here. They have been in power for six years, and when you see the Liberal platform say something like, introduce a comprehensive strategy to address problematic substance use to end the opioids crisis, uh, how do you react to that? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, we've been in an opioid crisis for five years. And I think, uh, you know, until we see action, they're just words on a paper and people continue to die. And so uh, I think, you know, I find it a little frustrating when it's been this long and we're still talking about creating a plan as opposed to actually implementing it. What would your view, Hassan, be on the issue of decriminalizing all drugs as a means to ending this crisis? Would that be a step in the right direction? It would certainly be a step in the right direction because we need to start looking at this as a health issue as opposed to a criminal justice issue. And criminalizing possession of, uh, you know, small amounts of drugs for personal use is not really getting us anywhere. It's just continuing this cycle of, you know, marginalization and pushing people out to the, the fringes of society. So it's certainly a step in the right direction. But you know, we have a legalized source of substances when it comes to alcohol, and we still see tremendous harms from that. So it's not going to be the silver bullet that fixes everything. Now, Quam, when the current prime minister's father was the prime minister of Canada, and we're going back almost 50 years now to 1972, he struck something called the Ladane Commission, a member of the Supreme Court heading up this uh, committee that was looking at the decriminalization at the time of marijuana. It advocated that, and... Trudeau, the father, decided not to go there. In 2019, Jane Philpott, who, of course, was the health minister and then resigned uh, from cabinet and was kicked out of the Liberal caucus, said, decriminalization of all drugs is not popular when you poll it. Question, is the decriminalization of all drugs advisable in your view? So you could have my view, <laughs> or you could have the view of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. So there have been national and international commissions that have looked at this. And what they found is that when you go down the line of prohibition, that uh, the market and the market for a particular drug acts a certain way. So you make it illegal, and so trafficking becomes difficult, which means they make smaller, more potent drugs. And that's how you end up with hooch and stuff like that. Uh, in prohibition, you ended up with smaller, more potent alcohol. If you uh, criminalize or uh, other substances, uh, the market produces things that are easier to smuggle, which is smaller and more potent. And that's what we're finding with things like fentanyl, um, and that's what we found with just about every drug. And as they become smaller and more potent, the number of people who uh, end up with uh, serious consequences, such as uh, the opioid crisis and the deaths, increase. OK, so that's what we've got to think about. Uh, and then, of course, if you go full legalization, then people worry that you get an expansion of use of the drugs, which leads to more problems as well. So you've got to find the sweet spot. And some people say the sweet spot is regulation. 
where uh, you limit the uh, access and supply, but you don't criminalize and you make sure that people who need those drugs, who uh, are uh, uh, addicted to those drugs, can get them. And so that's how people like the Global Commission have been thinking. And they're saying, if you're going to do that, dip your toe in the water to start off with by using, by doing it in a drug with uh, smaller amounts of harm. And so you start with something like cannabis and then you work up to working, to making sure that you've got the legislative muscle and you've actually got the bureaucratic know-how uh, to actually get to uh, regulating something like uh, opioids. And so some people might see what the Liberals have done over a period of time as a sensible joined up strategy towards, um, towards regulation. Other people would say it's not. <laughs> it's just one policy at a time. Uh, so it, it, you, we need to see where this goes. Uh, but certainly if you polled now compared to uh, when you are polling uh, just a few years ago, uh, I think you'd find slightly different results on the number of people who would support further uh, legalisation regulation. So I think it may be different now. And I think, uh, you know, Jane Philpott's uh, had a particular view at a particular time. But the context has changed. True. Okay. Uh, last 30 seconds to you then, Hassan. Whoever becomes prime minister after the 20th, what's the first thing they ought to do on this file? I mean, I think the first thing they need to do is uh, embrace this kind of large radical paradigm shift that Kwam and I have been talking about here today. Um, I think if you're asking me for a specific policy, I think probably decriminalization and looking at a safe supply are the two most important first steps because that's going to prevent people from you know, experiencing the most immediate harms, but we have a lot of work to do. Hassan Sheikh and Kwame McKenzie, it's good to have both of you on TVO tonight. Thanks so much for your uh, wisdom and expertise on this. Thank you very Thank much. You for us. And that is the agenda for Monday, September 13th, 2021. Top pocketbook issues in this election cycle are child care and housing. So tomorrow we'll assess the party's offerings for both. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.